But good morning, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Um, Happy New Year. Happy New Year on behalf of my wife and I. Uh, We are so glad that uh, you've come to church today. And there's no doubt that God um, has something great for all of us. And I want to welcome all our first-time guests. Thank you for uh, choosing to be with us this morning. Um, You are welcome to worship with us anytime uh, that you like. Um, My wife and I, for seven days, were at the magical kingdom of of Disney World. And uh, I don't know if I... Um, lost my salvation or if I gained it back, I don't know, because when you're with that many people, a lot of stuff happens. And so uh, one thing is that we went on Splash Mountain on, on Thursday night and I got sick. So, uh, so I probably won't scream as much, but I've said that before. Amen. So let's do this. I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter one. I want to jump right in <clears throat> into the word before I lose my voice and And speak too much today. Revelation chapter 1. We'll start reading at verse 4. And uh, so get your phones out. Get your Bibles out. um, And if you don't have either. uh, You can look up on the screen. Amen. Anybody excited right now? Anybody? Okay. Just checking. Just checking. Revelation chapter 1, we'll start reading at verse 4. The word says this. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us, And washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now look at verse 6. And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Lord, I want to thank you for every person that has come uh, to this place this morning. There's no doubt in my mind that you have something to say today. Holy Spirit, I need your power, I need your strength um, to overcome uh, the weakness that I feel right now in my body. And I pray, Lord God, that there would be nothing to stop what you have to say this morning. And I pray, Lord God, for a spirit of openness. I pray that today, Lord, people would be able to receive a word that would launch them into something big for 2020. And Lord, we, we, we wanna move beyond what has always been and move into a new realm of victory, Lord God. And so, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us today? Would you share with us what you have in mind, Lord, for our lives for 2020 and for this church, God? Jesus, I pray that if there be people sick here this morning, people who are depressed, people who are discouraged, God, I pray that through the preaching of the word that you would send your word and you would heal every infirmity. Lord, I rebuke the spirit of infirmity this morning. I rebuke the spirit of sickness spirit of depression, Lord God. I, I, Father, just speak joy and life into this house, Lord God. And, and Holy Spirit, you are welcome this morning. You are welcome to bring your energy. You are welcome to bring your hope, Holy Spirit. You are welcome to bring your power. You are welcome to come and demonstrate the power of God in this place, Lord Jesus. And so we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Now look at your neighbor and say, have you lost weight already in 2020? Come on. Remember, this is the only time that you can lie in church. You may be seated. (laughs) Well, today and for this entire month, I want to set the tone for Sendero Life Center for 2020. So I'm going to need your attention for about 30 minutes. And then I'm going to let you go home. And I also want to be careful to not fall into the trap of Christian cliches that every pastor and every church and every Christian makes at the beginning of every year. I've never been one to be really fond of the Christian cliches um, that many people talk about and make all these resolutions. Um, and then by day three or week two, they've broken every resolution that they set out at the beginning of the year. But I do want to be clear about what I feel the Holy Spirit is saying to our church 
and what God wants to do in 2020 in your life and in this place. Let me ask you this question. Now, I, for those of you who are new, I, I, I want you to understand that this guy up here uh, is a hardcore old school Pentecostal. And I still believe in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, and what if this were the year for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life? Or what if this was the year that the things that you've prayed about for years become a reality? W- would you get excited about that? I, I know sometimes, uh, you know, we're, we'll be in church and, and we, won't get, we won't get too loud. And maybe it's because of how you were raised. But I, I find the paradox so interesting that, that we won't get loud in church, but we'll get loud for a football game. And, and so at this church, we want to train you that it's okay to laugh. It's okay to be a little loud as long as you're not rude. Amen? Um, but what if, this, what, what if this was the year of salvation? What if you finally got your healing this year? What if God restored you and healed you from things that hurt you and wounded you in the past? You know, at church leadership, we've gotten together the last few weeks before we entered in this new year, and we came up with some goals that we prayed over and we thought about things. Some might be a little lofty, others might be a little low, but this is probably what, what we're thinking that God wants to do in, in 2020. We're believing, and you can look up on your screen, we're believing for uh, 800 people every Sunday to come through the doors of this church. Is that a good, that's a good... I, I tell you, that's a, that's a 30% increase over 2019, which is not too bad because in 2019, we grew by 57%. And so we, we averaged 615 people um, in 2019, and we're believing that we can have 800 people weekly or, uh, every Sunday walk through the doors of this church. We're believing God for 500 salvations, decisions to serve Jesus here at this altar. All right, thank you for a few of you that get excited about salvations, but, but we're going to press the issue on that because, because when, when somebody gets saved, they literally get rescued from hell and that deserves standing ovations. That, that deserves joy. If, if the angels get excited at one person repenting, then how much more should we get excited when we give a goal of 500 people to get saved at this altar? I, and, and, and that's a very low estimate because we're only talking about uh, about Sundays and Wednesdays, uh, our number last year was actually 325 for the entire year. Our goal, our goal was 200, and we broke that right after Easter. And so what if this year, 500 people, and maybe, maybe you're here today and you haven't accepted Christ as Savior. Maybe you're going to be the first to 500. And we also believe that out of those 500, 250 of them would want to be baptized in water, and 250 of them would want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the gift of tongues. Uh, the, these, are, these are expectations that we have, demands uh, per se, if you want to say that we are putting a demand on heaven, and we're asking God, may your kingdom come, and may you do these things. And we'd like for each of you who call Sendero home to get involved in one of our many ministries. You see, as a church, we do a lot of outreach. We do a lot of ministry every week. And I can tell you firsthand that many of our staff and many of our volunteers have gotten tired uh, in 2019, especially as we went to three services on Sunday. And we do so much with, with very few volunteers. But can you imagine how much more we could do if many of you got involved at least in one ministry throughout the week? Can you imagine of if we had 800 in attendance and 400 people actively using their gifts and their calling and connected to this church. That's our goal is that 50%. Now the average nationwide is 20%, but how many of you know the Sendero is not an average church? And so, and so we, we want 50% of our people to get involved. And, 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 and we need so much help from Club Fuego Children's Ministry. Right now, Ernie and Gabby are doing an amazing job with, with your kids. And they're having a great time. And, and our nursery still needs help. And Nathan and Soul have just done an amazing job in our new nursery over there. But, but we need more help with rescue youth. Pastor Freddie and Pastor Brianna they did a rescue. Uh, a we Are Kings Lounge over in the other building. And they're giving your kids Red Bulls. And hopefully those red bills will kick in so they can say amen while I'm preaching, okay? But, but they're, they're, they're blessing your, your students and, and they're doing a great job, but they need more adult help. 
Every Wednesday, there's very few adults in here and we have 70, 80, 90 kids with very few adult volunteers. Can you imagine how much more we could do if more of you got involved in our youth ministry? Uh, we need more help with, um, with our bus ministry. We go out every Wednesday and we pick up students to come to youth ministry. We need more help with our Sunday morning and Wednesday uh, evening kids check-in. It seems like I'm seeing the same people every Sunday checking in kids and people get tired and some people want to sleep in. And can you imagine if we had 30, 40 people who would want to volunteer a couple hours a Sunday once a month just to check in and say, hey, welcome to Sonetto Life Center, check in your kid. It's not that big of a commitment that if you'll try it just one Sunday a month or one Sunday every two months, we'll take anything that you'd be willing to give. But, but it, I'll be honest with you, it kind of saddens my heart when I see the same three or four people week after week doing that ministry. We need more of you to get involved in that. We, we also need more help feeding our volunteers. You know, a lot of the volunteers are here from 7 a.m. until 3 p.m. And in between services, we'll give them some continental breakfast or some breakfast burritos or, or sandwiches or something. And we need more help. People who'd be willing to volunteer and come and, and pass out food. And, and you don't have to buy a thing, by the way. Uh, the church provides everything for that. We, we need more help on Wednesday evenings with Sendero University with our teachers and, and teaching our students. That, that's where we do our, our Sunday school for our kids. We need more musicians. We have an amazing worship team. But do you notice the same faces every week? Even I get tired of looking at them. And, and so... So we need, we need more because we have three services and, we, and, and Jessica would like to rotate more people. So, so we need, uh, now I'm not talking about air guitar because I, a lot of us play the best air guitar on the planet, but, but we need people who are musicians, who are drummers. And, uh, you know, Anthony and I have had discussions and, and you never see Anthony because he's drumming in the dark, but, but he's one of the few drummers that, that we have. And, and, he, and he mentioned something, he's like, pastor, the church has grown, but I'm still the only drummer. And so if you're a drummer here, now I'm not talking about just wanting to hit things. If, if you have the gift, you come see us. We, we, we want to get you plugged in. We want to get you involved. We, we, need, we need more help with singers. Now, now I, I kind of laughed when they sang Raise the Hallelujah this morning because if some of you saw my wife and I at the Oakland International Airport, we sang that song to the entire airport. Sing a little louder, right? And, and so I kind of laugh. Now, I can't sing, and so I'll never be on the worship team. But, but some of you have voices. We need, we need more help with more singers. Uh, we need more help with our media and our online ministry. Our online platform is one of the biggest in, in eastern Washington. But we need more and more help. People, some of you students who are really good at, at techie stuff, get involved, plug in, go see Mario, go see Pastor Freddie. We need help with lighting. We need people that would run camera. We have three cameras, but we can only really run one per Sunday because we don't have enough help with people who just want to sit behind a camera and, and just follow me around. Now, you would think there would be a line for that, <laughs> but there's not. We need people who would want to help with our sound system, people who know sound, sound engineers. We need, we need people that would want to help with maintenance outside. We need more prayer teams. Listen, our ushers and security team seems to be shrinking. We, we need more people who would want to volunteer maybe one Sunday a month to be an usher, to be a door greeter, maybe to hold those welcome signs because that makes a big difference in people's lives. If you, it doesn't take a lot of gifting. You don't need to know 100 languages just to hold a sign that says we love you or welcome to this church. We need, we need security team members. We need greeters. Some of you know that last week uh, someone went into a church in Texas and, and, and shot up the church. And thank God for the church security that took that man out. So if there's anybody here, I need you to know we got security. We'll take you out, all right? Um, <laughs> And, and we need more greeters at the door. We, we need more parking lot attendants. You know, we had this engineering firm with us uh, about a month ago. And, and afterwards, when we were done, I asked them, how did you like church? They're, they said, man, your church is amazing. There's not one thing we would change about your service except for your parking lot. Your parking lot is horrible. It's, there's no direction. There's nobody out there parking cars. It can get crazy. You need help in that area. And so we need help with guys that, and gals that would want to put on a bright yellow vest and help us park cars. And the reason why we don't have that is because nobody wants to help with that. Family, we're a church on a move, but we need you to move. 
And this year, we want to push that. We want to push Sendero 101. And that's a, if you're new to the faith, it, that's just a class where you get to know what the basics of your faith is. We, we truly believe that once you get saved, if you can dig some deep roots, no matter what comes your way, you're never going to walk away from your relationship with Jesus. We, we have a culture class that, that gives about what our core values are as a church. And, and you take a gifts and assessment class. And, and we have small groups all throughout the week, including Wednesday nights, including Mondays and Tuesdays and Fridays. And those are, we've called them our restore groups. And in those groups that we even just opened up, uh, one in Othello finally, uh, last month. And, 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 and we want, we want them all over the region so that, so that we can, everything that we do can reflect the vision that God has given to Sendero Life Center. What is that vision? We've talked about it so much. It's healing and restoring the call of God. That's what we want. We want God to restore you. We want God to heal you. We want the call of God just to jump out of you. And and I believe that if Sendero Life Center can truly participate with God in healing and restoring the call of God in people's lives, then I believe all of you will want to get connected and you'll want to connect your gifts and connect your calling to this house. And, you know, we're also looking into building expansion. We're, We're looking at a new parking lot. We're looking at building out from this building to get a a better lobby so that people can hang out and drink coffee before church and after church. And and that's going to require, though, financial uh, generosity from everybody that comes to this church. Um, If you don't give regularly to this house, I want to challenge you. If, If you call this place home, I want to challenge you to begin to tithe to this place, to begin to give your finances. And if you aren't used to giving God first, and, and what, what does the tithe mean? It's just, it's giving God first. Whatever percentage you want, it, it, there's, there's not a rule about it. it, it it's, it's something that God puts in your heart to give to the place where you worship, so the place where you worship can effectively carry out the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those of you who are new to this church, this church does not operate on millions and millions of dollars. Listen, we did our budget. I think we're going to end the year with $29 positive. Because everything, that, and I'm not joking with that number, because everything that comes in goes out. Because we believe in reaching into our community. We believe in reaching the nations. We, we believe in spending the money in a right way that reaches out and honors God. Can I get an amen? Because you guys are kind of making me nervous this morning. And so if you're not used to giving, I want to challenge you in 2020. Change that about, about your life. Be, become a giver. And if you already give, then I want to challenge you to go above and beyond and step into true generosity and give towards a, a new building that we are projecting and we're praying about. Now, enough with all that. And some of you are going to say, well, thank God, because I hate when they talk about money. But, but more than numbers... Mary and I, my wife and I, we could honestly, numbers don't really matter. Because what what Mary and I want most is that each of you would truly experience the power of God in your life this upcoming year. And that that power, you see, one one of the problems that that we have is, is we in the body of Christ today is just a lack of demonstration of God's power. And that's what we want. We want you to be able to hear God's voice clearly so that you could live in complete freedom. And and we pray that our church would be a radiant church with the light of Jesus in this community and in this region. And that Sendero Life Center would be known for our love and for our freedom and for our joy and our laughter. It's okay to laugh in church. I need you to understand that. This is not a cemetery. This is not a morgue. We want people to be able to feel free and to feel joy and feel connected here and where the spirit of honor would guide our relationships. And I believe that this year is going to be a time for strengthening our faith. Just strengthening faith. Listen, if we don't get to 800 people, big whoop. We we gave that number because because we have vision. But, But if we don't... If we don't reach 800, I'm not going to be disappointed. So as long as you are strengthening your faith. If we end the year at 615 like last year, or, or even if we shrink, as long as you have strengthened your faith, then we've done our job. That's what we want. We, 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 want, we believe that, that this is going to be the year where you have to dig deep spiritual roots 
and transition into a true, meaningful relationship with Jesus, where that relationship with Jesus guides your every decision and guides your every move where your emotions don't guide you, where the ups and downs don't lead you, but where that relationship leads you. A season where we do, as Hebrews 12 tells us, that we throw every weight off of us that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. To get rid of those things. Because what is coming to your life, listen, I'm not a prophet, but let me prophesy this morning. What is coming is going to require deeper devotion to Jesus. I'm going to say it again. What's coming to your life will require a deeper devotion to Jesus. I want you to understand I didn't say a deeper devotion to Sendero. I didn't say a deeper devotion to ministry. I said a deeper devotion to Jesus where you may have to adjust some of your core values and where you will need a greater commitment to trust that he's got you in his hand. Some of you are going to need to hold on to him when hell comes against you this year. You're going to need great faith for a miracle. Huh. But you can't have this great faith until you come to know who Jesus is and how he feels about you. You are the apple of his eye. You are everything to him. So don't despise difficult seasons. Don't run from the pressure that may come at you or you're already feeling perhaps the first week of the year and don't curse your pain. It may not make sense now, but God will get glory out of what you're going through. I love what Job said thousands of years ago. He says, he knows the way that I take when he has tested me. I will come forth as gold and though he slay me, I will trust him. Can you trust God when he has taken away the thing that value that you value the most? Can you still serve him when what you've been asking for doesn't come to your life? Will you still honor him when all hell comes against you? That's how you know that someone is really serving God. Job teaches us that we need to trust God through adversity because God is good. And at the end of the day, goodness will prevail. You may not feel it today. You may not even feel it tomorrow. You may think that life has thrown you a curveball, but not to God. God has it all under control. And if you and I can have this attitude that we can trust God, then we will be able to walk in victory. So how do we do that? And, I, and I'm almost done. How do we do that? Well, the scripture that we read at the beginning of the sermon uh, was written by the apostle John. John is in exile on an island called Patmos. And he's been placed there by the emperor Nero. um, And he's there waiting to die. And while he's on this island, exiled, it's there that he has a vision called the revelation. And it's a revelation of the end times where God, God uh, speaks, Jesus speaks to him and tells him how the, how the world is going to end. But I love how he begins the book. He begins the book by saying something so profound about Jesus. First, he calls Jesus a faithful witness. He says that he loved us, that he washed away our sins with his blood because of his love. But then he calls Jesus this, ru- the ruler over the kings of the earth, the ruler over the kings of the earth, all right? So he's the ruler over the kings. So who are the kings? Well, then he says that he has made us kings and priests to God. And this really spoke to me when I read it back in October. So once one Tuesday night in October, I sat with our production team and I gave them this theme. And so we, they began to have all these, and I love them. I love our creative production team because uh, Mario and Pastor Freddie and David and Pastor Juan, we were there and and talking about what should we do and they came up with all these designs and it was right then and there that we saw the logo and and I believe next week we're going to have some merchandise that you might want to buy and and kings and all this and you'll see Pastor Freddie has a a hoodie on about it but it was then and there that we decided that, that this would be our theme for the beginning of the year. And it's called, the theme is, we are kings. And I want to show you through the scriptures that when God looks at you, he looks at you through the lenses of sonship and kingship. Sonship and kingship. In other words, when God looks at you, he sees you as a king or a queen. Amen, Amen, Pastor Mike. That is amazing. Thank you guys for saying amen. I appreciate it. But when God looks at you, he sees royalty. Can I get an amen? And so for the next several weeks, we're going to look at some of the kings of the Bible. 
And we're going to look at their victories and their defeats. I, I'm going to show you in a couple of weeks about a man named King Saul. And, and King Saul was an amazing leader. In fact, uh, you know that, that we know that Jesus comes from the line of David. Well, he should have come from the line of Saul. But Saul could never deal with his baggage. And because he never dealt with his baggage, he forfeited his legacy. And I'm going to teach you and show you through scripture that when you don't deal with your baggage, you'll forfeit the blessings of God prepared for you. And so we'll look how, how he had the potential to be this amazing leader, this amazing man of God, but because he didn't want to deal with his insecurities, he didn't want to deal with his jealousies, he gave up all the potential blessing in his life. Things don't change, family. When we don't deal with our little idiosyncrasies and we don't deal with our problems, we forfeit the blessings of God in our lives. Uh huh. Yeah, you don't need to say amen for that to be true. And, and so then we'll look at David and how David loved worship. And we'll talk about what it is to worship God. But we'll also look about how David also fell out of grace for a moment because he wasn't positioned where he should have been positioned. He let his guard down. And when he let his guard down, he cheated on his wife. And we'll find out that when we let our guard down, it's a lot easier to sin. So we'll look at David. We'll, we'll also look at Josiah, how Josiah was this young up and coming leader and, and how he brought revival to Israel. And we'll also look at a man named Ahab who had the potential to be an amazing leader, but he allowed an evil spirit to control his life. Now, most importantly, more than any of those kings, we're going to look at Jesus. Because remember, Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And it does us no good if we don't understand that we are kings, but we are under a king. And that king tells us how to live, and that king tells us how to rule, and that king tells us how to reign. I, I need you to understand that Peter, when he's writing in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says this, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited because many of you might know this. Many of you don't know this. You probably already do, but I suffer a lot with insecurity. I suffer a lot with looking at myself at, at the way God looks at me. And so when I read scriptures like this, it, it takes me out of my stupidity and it puts me in a place where I no longer need to look at myself through my eyes. I look at myself through God's eyes. And God says, I am chosen. I am a royal priesthood. I am a holy nation and I'm God's special possession. So it doesn't matter if everyone rejects me. I am God's special possession. You need to get that for your life. That'll take you out of your funk. That'll take you out of your depression. If you will understand that it, to God, you mean everything. You mean everything to him. You are chosen. You are handpicked. You have been set apart. You are his treasured possession. So it doesn't matter what anybody on this planet calls you or does to you. What matters most is that you are God's treasured possession. And family, God considers you royalty. Man, he, he does. And, and many of us can't quite get that because we live with a poverty mentality. We, we live as paupers. We, we live as, as beggars, just having to beg our way through life and just barely making it check to check. And, 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 and by the way, when I talk about royalty, I'm not talking about financial prosperity. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking prosperity of the soul. That I have enough in my soul account that I can laugh and I can worship when I feel like I'm going bankrupt. That, that's, that's what I'm talking about here. And, and that's what we, that's what we got to get, that, that we are royalty and God has crowned us as his children. Now, crowns represent triumph and victory. In fact, Psalms 104 says this, that we've been crowned with love and compassion. Psalms 8, 5, and 6 further says, we've been crowned with glory and honor, and God has made us rulers over the works of God's hand and has put everything under our feet. Yeah, that spirit of lust, that spirit of pornography, that's under your feet. That spirit of anger, it's under your feet. That jealousy that you struggle with, that, that spirit of comparison, how you compare yourself with other people, and that's why you buy things and you get into so much debt because you compare yourself to somebody else, that should be under your feet. Yeah, that, that, that anger that you battle with, that's under your feet. That insecurity, that depression, that discouragement, 
that, that, that mentality that feels like you are going to go crazy. That is under your feet. Is anybody understanding what I'm saying today? As royalty, all those emotions are under our feet. And as royalty, we carry honor. We honor people. Do you get that? We honor people. And do you know that, that the, you know, in this world it says that I'll only respect you if you respect me? Understand that our kingdom is not of this world. So we honor even when we've been dishonored. And I'm not saying that you have to be a doormat and you have to let people walk all over you. No, because we're not suckers either. Amen? But I will tell you this, that we walk and we live with a spirit of honor. If somebody, if somebody tells you off, you don't have to tell them back off. You can want to. Listen, 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 listen. We were in Disney World with 100,000 people on New Year's Eve. And I wanted to tell half of them off. I counted 50,000 people that I wanted to cuss out that day. And there was only one that got it. I didn't cuss her out. I just pushed her. I'm like, get out of the way. I want to get on this ride. I, you talk about my patience being tried. It was there because I, the only place that I like a full house, a full crowds is this place. Every other place, if I go to a restaurant and it's full, I'm out. I mean, wherever, I I just, I can't deal with big crowds unless we're in church. I I might be a hypocrite about that. I might be biased, but I I only like church full. But, but you talk about dishonor and, and impatience and, and I get hot really quick and I start sweating really fast when it's humid and it's hot. And I'm like, I'm going to choke the next person that cuts in line. The next person that cuts in this line, I've been waiting for this ride for three hours. If one more person says, excuse me, I'm going to trip them. And I'm going to blame it on Maddie. I'm just going to say, oh, sorry, that was my daughter. Do you understand that you don't always have to say the things that you're thinking? I, I, need, I need you to get that. Because as royalty, we carry honor. We carry authority. And we have dominion. I need you to get this into your spiritual gut this morning. That your words carry supernatural weight. You create atmosphere with your words. You, you, you can kill and you can give life with the words that come out of your mouth. You have to be careful what you say. In fact, the Bible says that we are ensnared by the words of our mouth. Our words either create for us or they destroy for us. Many of us, we, we think something and we feel like we have to say it. No, you don't. You don't have to say it. Because listen to me, not every thought that comes into your mind is yours. Do do you get that? Some thoughts that you have aren't your thoughts. They're planted by the evil one. They're planted there by the enemy. This this is this was when years ago when my wife when my wife was struggling with her thoughts and 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 I won't tell you what they were, but she would she would feel guilty about these thoughts, which would dig a deeper hole in in her mind. And we would have to sit down, and she would explain those thoughts. And I'd say I'd say, baby girl, those aren't your thoughts. That's the enemy. Do, do you get that? This is not Mary Alvarado thinking these things. These are thoughts that are planted by the enemy. And so what does scripture tell us to do? Scripture tells us to take those thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience. And so we need to understand that not everything that comes into your mind is yours. And you need the ability to discern that and recognize that so that you can defeat the enemy, family, family. You are royalty. You are not just somebody. God has given you purpose. You are creative. You have something to offer. And so when when he says here that everything is under our feet, it means that you are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. And most importantly, as royalty, we have access to the throne of God. And that is the difference. Christina, you can come up already wherever you're at. That's the difference. Is you and I... You see, in in biblical times when kings ruled and they were on their throne, you couldn't just go before their throne whenever you wanted to. You had to be asked by the king to come before him. And if anyone went before the king before their time, they were killed. 
And so God establishes a new kingdom and he says, you can come before my throne at your pleasure. Whenever you want, you can come before the throne. In fact, Hebrews 4.16 4, says it like this. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Family, that, that gets me excited, guys. That I can go before the throne of heaven. And I, now watch what Hebrews calls it. The throne of grace. That if I've messed up, I can, before, I can go before that throne, not fearful of punishment, but hopeful of restoration. Did you get that? You see, I have, and I don't know where she's at, but I've got this beautiful 12 and a half year old daughter. And, and is she over there? Oh, there she is. Close your ears, Maddie. And some of you have already gone through this and Mary and I are, are going through it right now where we're trying to establish relationship with her and it's tough with a middle schooler. Can I get an amen? Yeah, middle school parents. Oh, for that you say amen, right? I should preach about middle school and everybody, revival will hit the church. But I'm trying to establish a relationship with my daughter that when she messes up, she doesn't say, shoot, I can't tell my dad. I want her to say, shoot, I better tell dad. You see the difference? The first one is based on fear. The second one is based on restoration and grace. Now, what does that require of me? That I show her grace. And I need you to understand that if me being an earthly father that God calls evil, if we want to be that way, how much more does our king, our father, that when we've messed up, we can be, go before him and find grace in time of need. There's a reason why the psalmist says he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. You need to understand, for those of you who are new to Sendero or new to faith, you need to understand that the king that you and I serve has an open-door policy that we can go before him at our ugliest, darkest moment. And he doesn't reject anybody. He won't reject your prayer. So as, as royalty, you have access to the throne of heaven. You, 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 need, you need to get this into your spirit before I let you go home today. Because as sons and daughters, as kings and queens and priests, we have access and confidence to go before the throne of God. Now listen, many believers don't get this. Now I'm talking about believers. People who say they're Christian. They don't understand this about God. And so they live as spiritual slaves. Slaves to their emotions. Slaves to fear. Slaves to the past. You're not, we're not telling you to deny what happened to you as a child, but I am telling you that the king can heal the memory. The, he, the king can heal the wound. But there are many Christians that, that choose to not let go of that. And then they become slaves of religion. And they're slaves of a, a system of do and do not. And can and can't. And, and, and a slave of routine. And, and if, I don't, if I don't go to church. Now listen, this is coming from someone who wants to see you every week. But there's a, there's a, syst, a systematic spirit of religion out there that... that that you have to walk this fine line and if you don't, you're going to go to hell. I, I reject that. I believe that we serve a God of grace and grace doesn't mean, and, and, and I know about greasy grace and sloppy grace. I get that. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But what I am saying that, that, that if you fail, you have grace. And the thing about grace is grace makes you not want to fail. Grace doesn't give you an excuse to mess up. What grace does is, I know, I, I know if I mess up, I can, go to, I can go to my father, but I choose to not to. I choose to not take advantage of that. And so many become slaves to their thoughts, slaves of rejection, slaves of disappointment, and slaves to Satan. And you don't understand that when you come into the kingdom of God as a king and as a queen, you must take on a new set of values, a new mind, and a new heart. 
A great Christian author named Dario Rodriguez said this. He said, true Christianity has a cost and demands real renunciation. It calls for a radical reorientation of values. And so when you come into the kingdom of God, you will have to adjust. And, and there's some in the kingdom that live so much up and down because they choose to hold on to their values instead of letting them go. But if you want success in the kingdom, you don't live according to how Sendero or Pastor Mike preaches. You live according to what the word of God says. And that's, that's how you base your life. And as you grow, you realize that you can defeat the enemy. You can defeat your flesh and you can live in victory. And why? Because we are kings. And that's what I want to close with today. We are kings. I'm not talking about arrogance or pride because if there's one thing that, that you need to understand about this kingdom is arrogance and pride are rejected. You see, because normally when one thinks of a king, they think of pride and they think of arrogance, a feeling that they are above everyone who looks down on those who are not like them. Um, but people that are like that, they don't understand the spirit of the king. If you're here and you look down on people, um, you're wrong. One thing that I love about this church, th th this church was birthed by farm workers, people with, with, zero, with zero income. And they, the church was birthed because there was just a hunger for God's presence. It was, it was just farm workers. And in, in the midst of, of a lot of racism in Moses Lake at the time, just farm workers, some Hispanic farm workers just got together and they wanted to have church. And, and their first bench was a two by six on top of two buckets. That was their first bench. And all they wanted was the power of God. And they didn't care if you had money or you didn't have money, if you had an education or no, educa or no education at all. That didn't matter. As long as, as long as you wanted to worship God, come. And even if you didn't want to worship God, come. That's how Sendero Life Center was birthed in 1960. And one thing that I love about this house is you have people with means and people who struggle with poverty. And we look at all of everyone the same here. I will never be moved by people who give more than others. Because if there's one thing that I battle with, is when I see people who are arrogant and prideful in church. I, I, I don't like being around people who are arrogant like that, cocky. Because that, that doesn't represent the king. Because the king, and, and we'll look at him next Sunday, but that king is humble and he is meek and he is mild. And he knows when to show his authority and, when he, and he knows when to embrace. Because that king, with him, mercy triumphs over judgment. And that king, his name is Jesus. And by the way, when he comes back, on his thigh will be written, kings of kings and lords of lords. And you need to understand that. That that's who he is. He is the king of kings and he is the lord of lords. And it's okay to be a king as long you, as you are submitted to the king of kings. And when you are submitted to the king of kings, you reject pride and you reject arrogance and cockiness and looking down on other people and you live with a spirit of honor. Are you with me this morning? And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you and I have to close. But I want to challenge you that in 2020 that you live as a king, that you live as a queen, that you understand what you carry that you understand that, that you are greater than what you think. That you can love the people that you don't want to love. That you can smile and raise your hands in worship when all hell is coming against you. Why? Because the king is inside the king. So I'll end with this. For your life, what will be different in 2020? Staying away from the Christian cliches, staying away from all of that 2020 vision and, and all that you saw on social media, staying away from all of that. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's good, but let, let's stay away from it for a second. What's going to be different in your life in 2020? What, what, what are you going to allow God to do in your life in 2020? I told my wife, I, I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I, I want to, in the, if I'll be transparent, I want to be able to look in the mirror and love myself the way I am. I, I, I don't really desire to be a better preacher. I don't, I don't desire to, to have a bigger platform because this is what I do. It's not who I am. Do you get the difference? This is what I do. This is my career. This is my ministry, my calling. But who I am is God's son, her husband, and her father. And that's where I want to grow. Because if I can grow in those areas, I'll grow in this area. And the same is for you. We've got to grow this year. We, we just, we've got to grow personally. And let's put this year, 2020, in God's hands. Let's commit to him. And so this is what I want to do. I, I, I'm calling for a 21-day fast starting tomorrow. Now, before you freak out, I'm, I don't like fasting. I'll be honest with you. Obviously, I wear a jacket, right, to cover. But I, I, starting, starting tomorrow for three weeks, I just want you to pick one day in those 21 days, just one, where, where you will give up food. Now, some people have given up social media, and that's fine. Some of you are addicts to that, and that's a, a true. But, but I'd, I'd like for you to at least give up a meal during one of these 21 days, okay? And during that time, it could be a lunch meal or it could be sun up to sundown. I'm not gonna tell you how to do that. That's, that's between you and Jesus, okay? But, but I want you to pick one day and during that day, I just want you to find 20 minutes, some point, and everybody's busy, I get it. But find some time to spend with Jesus, and say, Jesus, what I'm denying my flesh. What do you want me to work on this year? How, how can I grow? How can I be better? Help me to, help me to love my spouse. Help, help me to, 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 to love my neighbor. But, but I want to challenge you, family, during these 21 days, just, just pick one day. Some of you may do more. That, that's up to you. But, but pick one day. And then the next thing I'm going to challenge you is this. For the next 21 days... I want you to read one proverb, one chapter in the book of Proverbs a day. And, and it's, it's very systematic and it's very easy. Ready? Tomorrow is, is January what? Sixth? So tomorrow you read Proverbs chapter six. The next day is the seventh. I'm going to spoil it for you. What chapter are you going to read on the seventh? Proverbs seven. Now I got to tell you, Proverbs seven is kind of a crazy proverb because it talks about the prostitute and it talks about her eyes. Now, before you say, well, I don't deal with prostitutes, I need you to understand that when it's talking about prostitutes, it's talking about anything that causes you to take your eyes off of God. Anything that causes you to take your eyes off your spouse. It doesn't have to be a person. It could be money. It could be sports. It could be your career. It could be your personal ambition. So that's Proverbs 7. And then on the 8th, you read Proverbs 8. And, and let's just see what God speaks to us the next three weeks. What do you think? Isn't that a good way to start 2020? And then uh, the, the second to the last Saturday of the month, um, or excuse me, the last Saturday, Saturday of the month, we're going to do a 24-hour prayer chain in the church. And we'll ask for people to sign up. And we've been doing it the last five years where everybody picks one hour. You, some of you have done it. Some of you have not done it. But we asked that people would pick one hour to come and pray at church. And for 24 continual hours, that we would just spend time praying for God's will to be done. Family, this region is dark. It's dark. There's too many 
dumb things happening, whether they're drive-bys, whether there's gang activity, whether it's suicide, whether it's the problem with the school district right now, no matter what it is, the drug addiction, there is a lot of darkness in our community. And I'm not just talking about Moses Lake. I'm talking this entire region. This region is begging for the people of God to rise up. I almost feel in my spirit like the enemy is just daring us to rise. Because he knows that historically the church has backed away. But what if the body of Christ unites all over this region and says no more. No more suicide. No more drugs. No more gang activity. No more dysfunction. No more mental dysfunction. What if the church rises finally and takes her place in the community and becomes the change agency that God is asking her to become? It's in us. We are kings. But we got to do it. We got to commit.